Can we say, I am gifted? I am gifted. Oh, say like a finished strong type of saying. I am gifted. I am, gifted. I am healed. I am healed. <laughs> but now what? But now what? That's great. I'm gifted. I know I'm gifted. And we ended the last session with a, a time before the Lord. And maybe God is still going to continue to do a work in you. That I'll, now I'm healed from my past. I'm healed from my fears. I'm healed from my issues. I'm being restored in Christ. I'm being restored by the love of God and the power of God. But now what? After he heals you. After he restores you. Restores you. He, you need to know he needs you. Does that make sense? You can't just get your healing. You can't just know that you're gifted now. Whether you're a prophet, you're an encourager, whether you're a leader, you're a server, whatever you may be. You can't just know you're gifted. You can't just receive your healing and then just walk away. You got to realize the Lord needs you now. Now what? What are you going to do? <laughs> I just want to address this question. Why is it important to know your gifts? Then we're going to see how you can unwrap your gift. And then biblical guidelines for using and developing your gifts. And then we're going to just dive into the word of God. Why you should know. You should know your gifts. Because it will tell you, show you that you have been valuable to, in the eyes of God. Does that make sense? You are valuable in the eyes of God. took time out of his schedule to create you. And not only create you, but he invested a gift inside of you. Now you know what you're gifted with. Now you know there's a purpose with what God had created you for. Now you just got to find out how I can use these gifts. So he gives a sense of self-worth and purpose. Secondly, he assists you in setting priorities for study, growth, and ministry. Third, determine God's will for your voca vocation. Vocation means your industry or your job. You, when you know your giftings, You'll be leaning towards things that is going to pique your interest based on your giftings. If you know your giftings, you could also help avoid a lot of mistakes in determining what courses you take, what education track you go down, what field you want to work in. Like I said before, we're not all called for full-time ministry. We're not, and we don't need all to be in full-time ministry. If we're all in full-time ministry, then we're not going to have anyone to minister to. Right? But we need people in the body of Christ that in their, in their industry, in the culture that God is going to place them, in the industry that God is going to take them, you need to change that culture with the culture that God has given to you in your life. And that is a biblical culture. So if you know how you're gifted, you may, you may decide, hey, I'm not gifted... I'm not a gifted to show mercy, you know, so maybe, and I don't like blood, so I'm not going to go down the medical line, right? If you tell me to go down, hey, go, why don't you go start, study biology and start the process to become a doctor, you won't get me for that because I'll faint when I see blood. So if you force me to go down that road, I am to go grudgingly going to go down that road, and I'm not going to be successful at any point in that journey because I have fought that thing and I'm scared of that process. But when you know how you're wired, your personality, and we're going to get to that, and all those things, when you know that and how you're gifted, then the Lord can help guide you into the right track, into the right field for your career. Some of you are going down the wrong track for your career because maybe you just got forced to go down that road. I know people that, that, that dread going down that road, whatever that road may be for them. But make the right decisions. If you know what your giftings are, that could help you in that. Number, uh, we go on. Enables you to receive gift ministries of others. Mo I'm just going to read the last two. Mobilize the entire church on mission. Fosters unity among believers. See, if we know, if uh, Jerry knows, he is a mercy person. I'm going to call you a mercy person and a giving person, a giver. If he's a mercy person and a giving person, that means he's not gifted to lead. I'm not saying you can't lead. Uh, he's, he doesn't have the gifting. His strong gifting is not to lead or to serve in, in those. That's not his strong suit. It might be up there, but it may not be the highest ones. Right? So that means he needs those people in his life that are going to be leaders and servers around him in his life so that he could experience the fullness of God in his life. That's why we come back to saying we need each other. 
I'm gifted in a certain way. You're gifted in a certain way. But if I know how I'm gifted, then I'll know what I need from others. Does that make sense? If I put a bunch of leaders together, they're all going to lead and they're not going to know what they're leading and who they're leading. Right? If I put a bunch of servers together and say, hey, just if I tell a bunch of servers, go lead something, they'll look at each other. What are you talking about lead? We've, all we know is you give us something to do, we'll do it. Those are the servers, right? You just give them a task, they'll do it. They, they're not strong in the leading aspect. That's why the leaders need the servers. That's why the mercy people need the giving people. That's why the teachers, the exhort, we all need each other. It's a big puzzle that we need to come together and make the big picture look beautiful. We can't do this life alone. We need to embrace that, hey, I need Jerry in my life. I need Pastor Chandra in my life. Amen? I need this man of God sitting back there. I need that woman sitting there in my life because they are gifted in a way that could build me up. Once again, build us up. Why you should know. These are the why, reasons why you should know. This is what it takes. I call it uh, the shape. If they go to the next one. Unwrap your gifts. You know, when people celebrate Christmas or even their birthdays and anniversaries, you tend to give people gifts on those occasions. But those gifts may be wrapped, right? And, but what point is it if those gifts are wrapped and just sitting there? Until you unwrap your gift and find out what it is, you really can enjoy it. It's nice staring at a wrapped gift. It looks beautiful in the wrapping paper and in the bow and all the glitz and glamour of a wrapped gift. It's nice. But it's time we unwrap our gifts. And all we did this morning through the assessment is we unwrapped our gifts. Amen? We unwrapped our gifts. Now we open the box and we realize, oh, this is what it is. This is how I'm gifted. This is who I'm gifted. This is how I am gifted. I know how I'm gifted. This is what the Lord has, the greatest gift that God has given to us, His Son, Jesus Christ. But the next best thing is knowing that we have been gifted by a spiritual gift from the Holy Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Your spiritual gifts, which is an endowment of grace upon us, as we learned already. Your heart. What does that mean, your heart? For me, I just jotted it down like this. Sometimes we, some, we have a passion for certain things, right? Our heart passions are, gives us an, a satisfaction. Hey, I have a passion for the media team. I have a passion for technical stuff. I have a passion for videography or taking pictures. I have a passion to just serve. I have a passion for working on the computer and doing things administratively. I have a passion to play the instrument. I have a passion to do certain things. If your heart has a passion for that, be led toward those things. Don't run away from it. What your heart has a passion for, go and start getting involved in those areas. Don't go after things you don't care about. When you care about something, you'll take ownership of it. And when you take ownership of it, you'll see the excellence that will come through because you know I have a passion for this and I want to see the best that comes out of this. We can't have a church full of passionless people serving in areas that we don't have any passion about. Find a place that, you, that matters to you, that you have a passion for. Plug into those places. Find a leader or a coordinator in those places and, or even a person serving in those areas. Hey, how can I get involved in this area? And just start learning. Your heart passion. A, your ability. I put it simply as this. You're talented. Sometimes God just gives us talents. Amen? Talents are different from gifts. Okay? Talents are different from gifts. Let's make that clear. My talent is not my gift. Because nowhere in that scriptures did it say, these are your talents. You have a talent to play music. You have a talent to sing. You have a talent to act. Those are not gifts. Those are just talents. The Lord will bless it, anoint it for the ministry. But those are not gifts. Those are talents. So that is our ability. Our ability is our talent. Amen? Our ability is our talent. See, you could ask me to go play the keyboard on the worship team, and you will not enjoy any bit of it. Because I will make them sound really bad. You might want to ask them to come and speak here for two hours. And they're already shaking their heads because they, they can't do it. But they need somebody here to do what they do. And the people here need them to do what they do. So that at the end of the day, the body of Christ is blessed before they leave from this place. 
Use the talents and the abilities God has given to you. Train in those talents. Get better in those talents. Personality. <laughs> I just put it like it expresses itself in ministry. Your personality has to be subject and submitted to the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. There are aspects of my personality that I don't like, that I need the God to still work on. Same for you maybe, all right? But if we allow our, and our personality will come out in the areas we serve. We got to allow it to come out. That's how we are, unique. Let our personality shine through. If you're grouchy, don't shine through. Personality. Number, uh, number letter E, experience. I just, I just would say like, Cooperate. Cooperate with God. Experience. Cooperate with God. Your cooperation with God is necessary. That means in your experience, your life experiences, you have to learn to trust God. If you can't trust God through your life experiences, because every life experience can turn into a testimony to bless somebody else. But we have to decide if it will or not. So trust God. That even like Joseph, he, his brothers try to put him down in a pit, destroy him, kill him. But he can, at the end of the day, come back years later and say, what you meant for evil, the Lord has turned it around for good. Amen? So let our experiences have a message. Let there be a testimony that comes out of our life. We have to trust God. I'm moving quickly through this. Pastor Joe, in the morning uh, in exhortation, inauguration time, he touched on this a couple of times. There's a biblical way to use what God has given to us. Amen? We can't just randomly go use it. If, you, if God has blessed you with being equipped with the gifts of God, use it in a biblical context. Amen? We, have to, we can't just go randomly and just, hey, hey, I got a gift now. Hey, nobody here in this place, please leave from E-Gen 2015 and say, I, I found out my gift. Now I'm just going to go do it. Don't do that. That's not biblical. But in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, we're not going to take the time to read through it. But if you read that scripture, jot it down and take it home with you and read that scripture. Uh, Paul is telling Timothy, everything that you do must conform to the biblical teachings. It must stick to the doctrines of the word of God. There are going to be many false things that happens in society and many false teachings. And I, I am seeing that even, I don't know if it's happening here in the UK or but. I, not as much in, in America yet, but I, when I was in India for the past couple of weeks, a lot of people were saying, there's a lot of these churches and uh, gatherings coming up, up, teaching a lot of things that may not be biblical. I'm not going to even put a label on it, and I don't want to give them justification for anything. I don't want to even justify it by, by calling them out. But you have to discern through the Bible and through the Holy Spirit, is the teaching conforming to the Bible? Amen? 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, affirmed within the body of Christ. It, when you want to use your gift, the, the people around you in the body must affirm that, yes. I loved it that many of the people here, whoever came up here, many of the people that knew them said, yes, that's true. Right? That know those individuals that came, hey, that's true. That's, that's who they are, who he is or who she is. That's, that's how they act. You could see that in their life. That means the body of Christ is already affirming that. And the body of Christ needs to affirm. If, you're, if your church can't affirm you, then I, it's going to be hard for you to have credibility anywhere. Your church needs to affirm you. Holy Spirit is at peace within us. You see the scripture there, John 15, 26 and Romans 8, 16. The Holy Spirit is at peace within us. When we start using our gifts, we will not be anxious. Amen? We will be at peace when we know we are doing something for God. If we get anxious while we're doing something for God and we question it, doubt it afterward, I'm not saying it won't always happen, but if it continues to happen, we have to know, is the Holy Spirit really at work or are we doing something out of our own flesh? Okay? Offer your gift for common good as needed. No worth unless gifts used with love. <laughs> this is... A deep one. First Corinthians 13. I could do all those things. But it's like a clanging cymbal. If I don't do it with love. Amen. I could serve the church all the days of my life. I could encourage dear sister all the days of my life. 
I could speak encouragement or exhortation. I can give all the money I have. I can tithe every week, every day, exactly, and give more and above to missions and bless the ministry and make sure the kingdom of God is flourishing. But if I do all of that and I don't have love, it's like a clanging cymbal. If you're doing it with the wrong motivation, if you're doing it with the wrong intentions, if you're doing it for the sake of, hey, remember me, look what I did, then we are not doing it out of the right reasons. And out of everything that we do, can we do it because we love the people in the body of Christ? And Ephesians 4.1 says, live a life worthy of your calling. You got a calling in your life. Live a life that's worthy of your calling. My calling is different from your calling. Pastor Joe's calling is different from um, Aaron's calling. We've all got different callings. But can we be faithful and live worthy of our calling? That's all the, the Lord is asking us. Will we be faithful with our calling? Hallelujah. How do you get better at your gifts? How do you use your gifts? How do you develop your gifts? I would say just get intimate with God. Get intimate with God. Practice the gifts. Pastors, leaders, churches, give opportunities for the gifts to be exercised. Young people that know your gifts now, to go to your pastors in these communities. Hey, this is, who, this is how God has gifted me. How can, how can I help you? Amen? If you're a pastor here, that's the best question that anyone could come and ask us. Right? How can I help you in the ministry of the church? How can I help edify and build up the body of Christ? That's the best question that anyone can come to us in our offices and ask us, Pastor, how can I help? Instead of, Pastor, I have this problem. Or this person said something. Or did something. He looked at me the wrong way. I don't know what what issues you have here. But imagine if we all came to the pastors and said, because the pastors are an office that are responsible to equip you, all we want to do is see you grow and you see you equipped so that you can help the body of Christ and the name of Jesus be glorified. If they go to the next slide. Hallelujah. Develop your intimacy. John 15 is a very familiar scripture talking about the vine and the branches. Jesus is talking about it. Stay in the vine. You want to develop your intimacy. You want to develop your gifts. Let God help you develop your gifts. This is, a, this is something that I said back home in our church in, uh, on a Sunday message um, back in December. And it was in the context of Mary and the angel and, the, and God himself When she found out that she's going to be used by God to give birth to Jesus. And I was talking about that story. And in context of that, the intimacy that one has with God. If you are intimate with God. let me Sorry. If you're intimate with man, you can do the possible. But if you're intimate with God, you can do the impossible. What the Lord has said is impossible in your life. I promise you, if you start getting intimate with God, God can open up doors, bring down walls, and make sure that all that is impossible becomes possible because you are now intimate with God. It was impossible for a virgin to give birth, but she got intimate with God. And when she got intimate with God, the Lord said, if you're intimate with me, I can do the impossible through you. Some of you have been called to do the impossible. Some of you have been called to pray the impossible prayers, dream the impossible dreams, and do the impossible things. But you can't do it thinking you are going to get intimate with man and get intimate with the church. You got to get intimate with something and someone that is higher than any of those things. You have to get intimate with the Heavenly Father. And when you get intimate with the Heavenly Father, when you get intimate with His Son, when you get intimate with the Holy Spirit, watch Him do the impossible in your life and through your life. 
We want God to do the impossible in our lives. Lord, heal me. Lord, bless me. Lord, take care of me. Lord, do this for me. Open this door. Close this door. But imagine if we said we were not selfish enough to say, hey, God, take care of me. But Lord, Lord, use me, oh God, and do the impossible. Can we take over London with the name of Jesus Christ? Can we take over Scotland and Glasgow? Can we take over Manchester? Can we take over the United Kingdom and the Ireland? Can we take over Long Island and New York? If we can, we have to get intimate with a God that can only do the impossible. Amen. Amen. To do the impossible, get intimate with God. Teaching time's over. I need you to pray for me. Can we take a moment to pray? Come on, close your eyes all over this house. We're going to finish strong. In the next half hour, we are going to finish strong. We're going to leave this place stronger than, stronger than we came into this place. If you believe it, cry out to God right now. Don't look at me. Don't, don't expect anything from me. I could feel it, but can you see it? I just dropped one. I'm holding something in my fingers. You know what it is? Can, can anyone see it? What is it? You, you can see it. What is that? Mustard seed. Mustard seed. It's a mustard seed. I got a whole bunch of mustard seed here. I think each one of us can take a mustard seed. And I believe some of us will take a mustard seed today. We're going to leave with a mustard seed. Size faith. That face is a a humongous wall. This mustard seed you can't see, but the wall you can, right? The mustard seed you can't see, but the wall you can, right? Jesus said, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you can tell this mountain to move and it will move. If you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, I could stare at my wall and say, Wall, you must come down. Wall, you must get out of the way. Or God, you must help me get over this wall in my life. Some of us, we come to a point in our life where we have hit a wall. Right? We've hit a wall. We've hit a closed door. We're looking for a next move by God. We're looking for the next opportunity by God. We're looking for the next open door. God, open this door in my life. God, open this way for me. I need you to move in this place. But what you see is not any opening. But all you see is a wall that closes that path for you. But once again, I tell you, you can't see it. But you can feel it. It's the size of a mustard seed. In the book of Joshua, chapter 5 and 6, we know the story of Joshua and the Israelites that now they're coming into Jericho, right? Moses now died and now he's coming into Jericho leading the Israelites and they've come into Jericho. They're coming upon Jericho, but they come into Jericho and see, wait a minute, the promised land is inside these walls. But wait, wait, God, you said this is our promised land. How come you put up a wall in front of us when we were right about to step into our promised land? Some of you, you have been led by God to a certain place. You have been led by God to a certain point in your life. Knowing you know and you've been trusting God. God, you have led me to a promise. But as soon as you're about to experience that promise in your life, either God or the enemy will put up a wall right before you step into your promise. Hallelujah. You walk into your life. You walk through your life and you're right about to step into your promise. But as soon as you're about to step into your promise, there's a wall that you have to face. Let me tell you one thing. Before you experience your greatest blessing, you're going to have to go through your greatest breakthrough. Before you can experience the greatest blessing that you've ever experienced in your life, you must go through the biggest breakthrough and the biggest challenges. That sickness comes in right before. That layoff comes in right before you're about to experience it. That failing grade comes in right before. That child that has an issue comes in right before. That marital issue comes in right before. Every question, every doubt, every confusion comes up right before you're about to step into your promise. Spirit of the living God. 
Joshua and, the, Joshua and the Israelites was about to step in. They were about to step in. But then they saw this wall and they said, what do we do? Joshua didn't know about Jesus' saying because Jesus had not said it yet. But I want to believe he had a mustard seed sized faith. We get the advantage that Joshua didn't. Because we know everything Jesus said. Even when we know the playbook, even when we know the guidelines, even when we know every aspect of how we can live and how we can attain the promises of God and how we can, we can remember the promises of God and how we can experience the promise of God. Even though we got all the answers in here, we sometimes ignore to go to the playbook. Joshua didn't have this playbook. All he had was a Moses that said and told them and then the Lord spoke to him in chapter 1 and said, do not fear, do not be discouraged, do not be afraid, be strong and courageous and stay in with me, stay in my commands, follow every command that I give you, do not go to the left or to the right, but you stay with me, you remain in me, you get intimate with me and when you're about to go into your promise, even though you're going to face a great challenge, you will see the God of the impossible show up. Spirit of the living God. <laughs> but you know, before the wall came back, coin came down, there was, a, there was an instance where the spies were sent in, right? I'm not going to go through reading the scripture just to save our time. The spies went in and they found this woman. Oh yeah, this woman. She had a past. She had a label. She was the harlot, Rahab. Hallelujah. But when the Rahab, the, uh, the prostitutes, the prostitute, when Rahab, the harlot, admit, admitted before the spies that your God is the only God, that we know in this promised land or in this land that is about to become yours on this side is Jericho okay this side is Jer Joshua and the Israelites this side is Jericho when Rahab on the inside knows that the people are afraid because of they know that God is in control that God is about to do something miraculous they knew it before they knew it amen the people inside the walls of Jericho knew before the Israelites knew that the walls were coming down your enemy is going to know. Your enemy is going to know. Your enemy is going to know. His days are numbered. Your enemy is going to know. He can't hold you anymore. His, your enemy is going to know. The devil is going to know. Your, he has not got a hold on you anymore. I'm, af I'm afraid the enemy knows, but the church doesn't know. Imagine if the church knew. Imagine if the church of Israel knew. Hallelujah. So they knew, Rahab knew, and Rahab made a decision. Hey, spies, listen, I'm going to help you out here. I know God is going to do something, and I, I know we can't be saved from this, but I'm going to help you out here. If it's okay with you, I'm going to help you out here. I'm going to allow you to, they're coming after you now. The army of, that's in Jericho is coming after the spies. They're going to try to find you, but I'm going to let you out of this place. You can hide here, and then you're going to be let out of this window in my apartment on the top of the walls of Jericho. You're going to be let out and let down by a scarlet cord. One thing you need to know, whether you're on this side of the wall or on that side of the wall, one thing you need to know, you need to rest in your faith. So what did Rahab do? She did her part. She believed. She confessed. And then she said, hey, I'm going to help you out. And she let them go through it. And the spies went through and they let out. I'm just fast forwarding here. And all she could do, I don't know the time gap between that and scene and then where the walls came down. But all she could do from that point where she helped them and let out the scarlet cord so they can get out. All she could do was what? Could she have put a committee together and figure out oh, what are we going to do next? Could she put a conference together on the top of the walls of Jericho and say, hey, we got to equip ourselves? All he could do, all she could do with her family, it says she got all of her family together and all they could do was in their living room, sit and wait. One thing you got to do first, 
just rest rest after you've confessed that God is God in your life after you can do everything you could do say Lord I'm giving you my home I'm giving you my life I'm letting you in I'm letting you out I'm gonna let you do what you want to do but at this point I'm gonna take a break I'm gonna sit down and relax and allow you to do what you have to do so right now you need to rest in this moment hallelujah sometimes we try to do too much thinking all of us that we do is what's good God's gonna bring us to what the victory sometimes we gotta move but sometimes we gotta sit down relax and rest in your faith in God hallelujah so she, she goes she's there she's waiting and the scene moves forward and Joshua's leading the people of Israel Hallelujah. And they lead up to the wall. And they start to walk around the wall. That it says in chapter 5 or 6, I believe it says that Joshua heard from the Lord directly, right? The Lord spoke to Joshua, right? He didn't speak to the entire church. He spoke to Joshua. One thing I noticed, when the Lord spoke to Joshua, Joshua got all the details from God of how everything was going to play out. Joshua knew all the details. Okay? This is one thing I didn't, I didn't catch until now. He got all the details. God said, this is what you have to do. Okay, we know the story. This is what you, you have to get everyone together, walk around the wall one time for six days, and on the seventh day, walk around seven times. And throughout all those times, you got to keep quiet. But on the last time and the last time, last moment, when I tell you to shout, you need to shout. Oh, and when you come, when you see that, you're going to see the walls come down. Joshua got all the details. And he started transferring all this information to his leaders. He started le transferring all these information to the priests, to the worshipers, to the Levites, to all the nation of Israel. He starts transferring all this information. But one thing he did not tell them. He did not tell them how God was going to do it. You got to read that chapter again. That's why it caught my attention. God, Joshua never told the people of Israel, hey, after you shout, the walls are going to come down. He did not say that detail. Sometimes God is going to tell us just to move, just to do, just to rest, just to speak, just to act, just to keep quiet. He's going to tell us most of the details. But he may not tell you how he's going to bring those walls down. He may not tell you how you're going to step into your promise. He may not tell you how you're going to pass that exam. He may not tell you how you're going to pay that bill, that, that, that debt that you have mounting up in your life. He may not tell you how that is going to be covered. He may not tell you how you're going to be healed. But He knows that He will do it if you're obedient to do what He tells you to do. So they come. They walk around. And they walk around the walls as instructed and they let out a shout and the walls came down and I thank God for the Holy Spirit that even through the worship in the midday and then also through a couple of the songs that were done through the action songs or some of the programs there during the talent demonstration they spoke about the walls of Jericho coming tumbling down and down and down and down the Holy Spirit is in control here today. The walls are coming, are tumbling down and down and down and down. How many of us believe that? <laughs> you need to rest in your faith. And there's another thing there. We have to capture from that scene before we get into our promised land. We are righteous by our faith. We need to rest in our faith. We are righteous by our faith. You know why? I need a, a scarf. Anyone have a scarf? A lung? Is it? A chin? Is it? Oh, thank you. Imagine this is red. Okay? For the sake of argument, this is red. This is hanging there. Where is it hanging from? From the harlot's house. Where is it hanging from? the prostitute's house. 
when Joshua and the Israelites came in and the walls start coming down and they said, remember that promise we made to that prostitute called Rahab? Go and spare that home, that family. They were sitting in their home, in their living room. They heard the rumbling of the walls starting to shake. They saw everything, the destruction that was starting to happen. They saw the people that were, they were doing life with starting to be destroyed. But they just had to sit there, wait and relax and rest in their faith. Not just in their faith in the spies, but faith in the God that she admitted to. And what happens? Here's where mercy triumphs over judgment. Because when Joshua and the people of Israel came into that land and they were looking for that, that prostitute's house, they were not knocking around or saying, hey, where's Rahab? What were they? Where's not, they're not asking around, hey, did you see Rahab? Did you see Rahab? Did you see Rahab? They can't do that. Because Rahab is hiding with their family inside the house. But all they can do is Look for the house with the scarlet cord hanging outside the window. When people are looking for who we are in the past, God is looking for are we righteous in the blood-stained life and in the Christ of Jesus Christ. When people are going to look for our old Rahabs, and our old prostitute labels and our old failure labels. I tell you this more this evening by the Spirit of the Living God, He's not coming to look for a Rahab, but He's looking for somebody that has been covered, that has been stained, that has been sealed in the red blood stain of Jesus Christ. Who wants to be stained by the blood of Jesus Christ? Oh. Who wants to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ? When you're covered in the blood of Jesus Christ, they cannot see the old sea. They cannot see the old linson. They cannot see the old jitu. They will not see. They cannot see. Because all they see is a blood-stained life covered in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh. The world doesn't see the blood-stained life. They still see a little bit of us. But today, tonight, I tell you right now, by the Holy Spirit, I tell you right now, somebody needs to hear this message right now. Oh, how about cuss? Somebody's been looking for a Rahab. You don't need to look for a Rahab. You need to look for the house that has been holding out the red scarlet cord that signifies the presence and the love and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Listen, your, your faith doesn't make you righteous. Your, your home doesn't make you righteous. Your heritage doesn't make you righteous. I'm a third generation minister. That doesn't make me righteous. But my relationship and my intimacy, me, intimacy with Jesus Christ makes me righteous Christ alone makes you righteous will the world see the scarlet cord the world must see the scarlet cord oh. thank you Jesus last but not least the story we said they already walked around the walls There's something that we need to do. The Israelites didn't know all the details, right? I just want to go back to that. The Israelites didn't know all the details. Joshua didn't tell them all the details. So what were they doing? They were walking in obedience and in... Come on, come on. We're church folks. Walking in... The Bible says that you must walk by faith... And not by, you must walk by, not by, walk by, not by, walk by, not by. Oh, wait a minute. I'm walking around these walls and all I can see are walls. All I can see are brick stones around me. But I, the Joshua just told me, he heard from the Lord. You must just walk around these walls for seven days. I'm going to keep my mouth shut and I'm going to just listen to what the people in my life are telling me, trusting they heard from God. 
we have a hard time listening to our leaders. But the Israelites listened to Joshua. You know why? Because they knew, they knew, they knew in their spirit that Joshua was not just saying something for the sake of saying something. But he had spent time with the Lord. And he went into the throne room of God. And he got down on his face before God. And he heard the Lord speak to him directly. They knew he heard from God. To young ministers like myself and to seasoned veterans in the ministry. Will our people know that we heard from God? When they know that we heard from God, they will do whatever we ask them to do. Because they know we're not asking them, but God has been asking them to do it. Joshua, Joshua tells them, they, they do it for six days. They walk around singing and they can't sing. They're just going around and they just silently walking around for six days once a day. But they're walking around staring at what? What are they staring at when they're walking? But you have to walk by faith, not by. But you're telling me I got to walk for six days. All I can see, Joshua, is these walls. But I'm going to listen to what you said because I'm trusting God told you to do, for us to do it. But all I can see with my sight are these walls. But I'm walking by faith. I'm sure in deep down in Joshua's heart, as much as he knew and believed that God was going to do it, I'm sure as any human being, a little bit of human nature, God is say, God, are you really going to do this? Right? little bit even though when you know you have that sealed word of God in front of you there's a little bit of us that says God are you really gonna do this you've never done this before has any walls been come crashing down before Jericho any walls come crashing down before Jericho any Bible scholars I don't know any walls this has never been done before in the history of the Israelite nation right it's never been done before but God you said you're gonna do this little bit of Joshua said God you really gonna do this you sure this is possible even with a little bit of doubt he walked faithfully around that that city he walked faithfully around those walls but what he was he really walking around what was he come on come with me a little deeper what was he really walking around those days he was walking around the promise of God they knew they were circling and surrounding their promise. There was just a wall standing between them and the promise. And that wall was about to come down. All God is asking you to do, you may be facing a wall, but your promise is on the side. You got to look at the promise, not at the wall. In your faith, with your spiritual eyes, you got to see the promise above the wall. In our human nature, we're going to get stuck staring at the wall. But with our spiritual eyes, we need to see the promise that is behind the wall. Don't let the enemy stop your vision. Don't let the enemy stop your passion. Don't let the enemy stop your faith because you can only see the walls. You need to see in your spirit that God has given me a promise and those promises that God gave me one minute ago, the promise God gave me 10 years ago, that's a promise that he will come to pass. Spirit of the living God. You must rest in your faith. You are righteous by faith. Amen. The book of Romans says that you are righteous by faith in God. And last, you must walk by faith. The faith, the size of a... They walked. Thank you, Jesus. And the walls came down. The God of the impossible showed up. As the worship team joins me here. Some of you need to see the scarlet cord. That you need, some of you need to hang out the scarlet cord. Some of you need to hang out the scarlet cord. Some of you need to embrace the scarlet cord. Some of you that don't know Jesus yet, 
you need to say Jesus I need to be covered in the blood of Jesus this morning I need to know that I'm not perfect but you make me righteous and I can only be righteous by the blood of the lamb the perfect in the blemishless blood of the lamb makes me righteous hallelujah some of you are facing walls in your life some of you are about to walk into your promise but the enemy and whatever reason but the, maybe even the Lord is putting a test before you the Lord does not tempt you the Lord tests you the Lord may be testing you to see will you be faithful to deal with this challenge to deal with this issue to deal with this hurdle to deal with this wall oh you need to some of you need to rest give your life over to Jesus and let him have at it some of you need to be reminded you are righteous by faith you are not a, you are not your past anymore amen be free from that you are not your past anymore you are not your titles anymore you are not your labels anymore you are not your mistakes anymore you are not your sickness anymore you are not your failures anymore you are not what people say you are you are righteous by Jesus Christ and then there's a there's a last group of people you need to walk by faith your walls may not come down on the first day that you pray you just need to be faithful to say Lord I don't see the walls but I see the promise and I'm gonna stay faithful to you till I see that promise imagine if the Israelites stopped after six if they stopped after the sixth day they said hey this ain't working I'm gonna go home this is not for us then they went to another place no they pushed they persevered they could have got depressed because there was no response from God for six days even on the last day they walked around tired and weary wounded and they might have said I'm gonna walk around six times around that wall around that city around that promise for six times on that last day but on the seventh time I'm gonna make sure that at the end of that seventh round this is we've done six let's imagine we've done six quiet This is the silence that was there for six days and for six times around that wall. Pin drop silence. That was the command of God. But for six days and for six times around that wall on the seventh day, I believe every time they rounded that wall, there was a praise that was being built up on the inside. There was... Shh, shh, there was a worship that was being generated on the inside. There was a gratitude, a shout that was getting ready to come out. Hallelujah. Shh. There was a shout that was being birthed on the inside. But it could not come out until the appointed time. But after the seventh time on the seventh day, when Joshua gave the command to the entire nation of Israel that was circling around, not just the walls that they could see with their spiritual eyes, but with the promise that they were circling, they could see and they were about to release a great shout. And with that great shout, the walls came a-tumbling down. We've walked six days. Quietly. We're on the seventh day and we're about to close up this service and we're about to close up figuratively our last part of the walk around this promise is happening right now and we've come to the last seventh circle around that promise around that wall in that moment right now I want us to go back into this story and if you allow me just to play the role in this drama of a Joshua, do you mind? Is that okay? Can I play the role of Joshua in this drama? Is that okay? I'm going to instruct the body of Christ, the nation of Israel, the church of God, the blood-stained children of God. Whatever you've been storing up on the inside, Whatever has been rising on the inside, there's a generation that's rising up. But inside a generation, there must be a worship that rises up. 
in this moment as we stand to our feet on a count of three. If you allow me to play the role of Joshua and I would count to three, can this YPE 2015, can we close this time, this day, this conference with one of the greatest shouts that you could ever give unto the Lord? Shh, not yet. Worshippers, you ready? You ready? Singers, you ready? That's what Joshua told. He told the Levites and the worshipers to go and lead the people. Church, you ready? I'm not trying to dramatize this for the sake of drama. I'm trying to say there is a wall that's about to come down in your life. But it's going to be dependent on your praise. If you keep quiet when the Lord tells you to shout, that wall will still be up. But when the Lord tells you to shout a praise, that wall will come tumbling down and down and down and down and down. Can we rise to our feet all over this house? This is the last time. We've come to the last time. Stop. With our eyes closed all over this place and with our hands lifted high. Getting ready to release one of your greatest shouts of praise and worship Ever you've given to God. How big is your wall? That's how big your praise and your shout has to be. Your praise and your worship must be relative to the wall that you face. How big is your promise? That's how big your shout must be. Ready? Instruments get ready. Hit the strings. Hit the strings. Get ready. On three. On three. On three. On three. On three. Hit the strings. Hit the cymbals. Let the place shout a shout of praise. Ready? One. Two. Three. Come on. Worship him. Let the walls come down. Let the walls come down in your life. Worship him. Worship him. Without a song, can you worship him? Without a melody, can you worship him? Without anything, can you worship him? Spirit of the living God, we worship you, we worship you, we worship you, Lord. We worship you, we worship you. Come on, worship till your walls come down. Release yourself. Let the Spirit of God empower you, be imparted upon you. Spirit of the living God. Come on, we want to see the walls come down. We want to see Jesus lift it high. You want to push the walls? Push the walls. 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 Let the Lord bring down the walls in your life. Come on. Jesus, we bless you. Jesus, we bless you. Jesus, we bless you. Jesus, we bless you. Jesus. Oh, we worship you, we worship you, we worship you. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, yes, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. It just takes a mustard seed size faith. Somebody that's facing a wall in your life. I want you to come and take a mustard seed right now. Take a mustard seed right now. Come out of your seats. Some of you that's facing a wall in your life, step out of your seats. Pick up a mustard seed right now. Come on. Who needs a mustard seed size faith? Spirit of the living God. We want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see Jesus lifted high. Who wants to see Jesus lifted high? Who wants to have those walls come tumbling down and down and down? Across the UK, across Scotland, across Ireland, across every city, every tribe, every nation and tongue. We want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land, that all men might see. Come on! We wanna see Jesus. Spirit of the living God, have your way in this place. Sweep over every life. Heal 
heal every soul, oh God. Release your people to walk by faith and not by sight. We want to see Jesus lifted high. Banner that flies across this land. That all men might see the truth and know that he's the way to heaven. We want to see Jesus lifted high. A banner that flies across this land. That all men might see the truth and know that he's the way to heaven. Come on, let's go. We want to see. We want to see Jesus We want to see We want to see We want to see Jesus lifted high Come on, keep worshiping We want to see Jesus lifted high Come on, have some fun You're going home now, so might as well have fun and go home truth and know that he's the way to heaven. We want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land. That all men might see the truth and know that he's the way to heaven. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus Jesus lifted high. Come on, give him a praise. 